Principia Mathematica, First Edition, Volume 1, Part 1, Section A, The Theory of Deduction. This video is the first in a series of videos which I hope to make covering some of the material in Whitehead and Russell's first edition of Principia Mathematica. These videos will not be some kind of short introduction to Principia Mathematica. If you're looking for a nice short video just giving the gist of Principia Mathematica, then you might be a little bit disappointed with these videos, since I'll be going into some detail with some parts of the work in these videos. Some of the concepts in Principia Mathematica do take some considerable time to explain in order to properly understand what's going on. So I make no apology for the fact that some explanations in these videos will be quite lengthy. If you don't like detail, then you might not much like these videos. And if you're looking for an explanation of the oft-referred to proof that 1 plus 1 equals 2, then there's plenty of ground to cover before we get there, so it could take a while. Principia Mathematica is Whitehead and Russell's attempt to make their case for a logical foundation of mathematics based on the theory of types. The theory of types is put forward in Principia Mathematica as a possible solution to some of the logical paradoxes, often referred to by Russell as paradoxes of a vicious circle type, and which had started to appear around the end of the 19th century and start of the 20th century. These paradoxes threatened to undermine many of the techniques which were starting to become widely used in logic and mathematics. And whether this theory, the theory of types, is correct or not, is not a question that I really want to address directly in this series of videos. I merely want to try to understand, as best I can, the theory of types in the way that Whitehead and Russell understood it when they wrote the first edition of Principia Mathematica, and to make my understanding available to other people. Whitehead and Russell believed that the foundations of mathematics are logical in nature. That is, that pure mathematics is nothing more than a branch of logic. Indeed, on page 94 we see, The purpose of the present section, section A, is to set forth the first stage of the deduction of pure mathematics from its logical foundations. I don't believe personally that there's much value in trying to understand Principia Mathematica in the belief that it will make you a better mathematician. The value of Principia Mathematica for me is understanding its historical contribution to mathematics, logic and philosophy. Understanding Principia Mathematica is a labour of love. If you want to be a better mathematician for, say, conducting research into mathematics, then I wouldn't recommend spending vast amounts of time on Principia Mathematica for any reason other than genuine interest in it, and an interest in the historical trajectory of mathematics and logic around the start of the 20th century. I'll just give some brief words regarding the introduction to Principia Mathematica. The introduction is not worth reading in its entirety before you start going through the main work. Admittedly, there's a ton of information contained in the introduction which, in some cases, is very important to sufficiently understand what's going on, but in other cases, is only really important if you want to get right into the fine details of Principia Mathematica. However, much of what is in the introduction will not make sense anyway, until you've actually worked through some of the appropriate sections of the book. Therefore, I'd recommend that the introduction be skim-read initially, or at least the first 20 pages or so, and then start on the main work itself. The introduction can then be referred to as and when it's necessary, in order to clarify certain aspects. It can take some time to get familiar with the contents of the introduction, and it's worth keeping notes of where particular useful passages are in the introduction, and reference it in the margin in the appropriate section of the book. Be prepared, however, to read and reread certain sections of the introduction and so on. I'll often refer to relevant parts of the introduction as needed throughout this video, and any further videos. I won't be going through the introduction in the methodical and systematic way that I'll be going through other parts of Principia Mathematica, for the reasons already mentioned. And I'll sometimes refer to other works, particularly Russell's 1903 book, The Principles of Mathematics. There are some things that Russell says in Principles of Mathematics which clarify some of the things that are said in Principia Mathematica. Though, admittedly, there are some things in Principles of Mathematics which completely contradict things in Principia Mathematica due to the various changes and developments that were taking place between when the two works were respectively published. I'll be basing what I say and my interpretations in these videos as much as possible on the facts as they're presented in Principia Mathematica. Therefore, I'll often try, in order to support what I say, to provide the relevant quotes from Principia Mathematica which I believe support my views. In some parts I'll be quoting quite extensively. And also note that I'll be consistently working from the first edition of Principia Mathematica. The system of Principia Mathematica in the second edition is very different in nature from the system of the first edition, and I'm not currently fully acquainted with all of those changes. Therefore, if you're more familiar with the second edition, then you may notice some quite substantial differences 
between what I say in some of these videos and what you may already know yourself from the second edition. I'll be trying to include as much as I can in these videos, but there's a huge amount of information contained in the 1900 or so pages of Principia Mathematica that sometimes things will necessarily be overlooked. I have not gone through every single demonstration of every single proposition in Principia Mathematica, and therefore there may be some points which you pick up on which I've overlooked. Even with some videos such as the ones that I intend to make here, in order to understand Principia Mathematica, it will be necessary for you to play a somewhat active role in developing an understanding, and this will probably involve some quite hard work. Principia Mathematica, at least in my opinion, cannot be properly understood by taking a merely passive role, and these videos are meant to support you and are not meant to be a total substitute for the hard work that will be required on your part. This is necessary to understand Principia Mathematica. It would be well, therefore, to have a copy of Principia Mathematica to hand to refer to as you watch these videos. And when it comes to some of the more philosophical aspects of Principia Mathematica, of which there are many, I may have interpretations of these aspects which may conflict with what other people think. I'm not a philosopher, and I'm not a scholar, and I'm not acquainted with all of the relevant literature. I'm merely an amateur with a keen interest. I also, therefore, do not guarantee the correctness of everything that I say in these videos. My aim is to create a series of videos which covers at least the first volume of Principia Mathematica. Of course, I'd like to continue on to the second and possibly third volumes, if ever this original aim is eventually fulfilled. However, whether I manage to cover the contents of Volume 1 will depend on whether I have the time and whether I'm able to afford to complete the project. The videos that I make require an immense amount of work, and if I have to stop making the videos at any point, then that's just how it is. I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but Russell's The Principles of Mathematics can help to better understand some things in Principia Mathematica. Having said that, there are some substantial differences between Principles of Mathematics and Principia Mathematica, which have to be taken into consideration. The Principles of Mathematics is a whole other work, which I'll hopefully be putting some videos together for in the future. A final remark on dot notation before we get started. Dot notation is something that's a concern initially when trying to read Principia Mathematica. Seldom, if ever, would this notation be encountered in contemporary logic and mathematics. Nevertheless, in my opinion, dot notation is best learned through exposure, and is not as difficult to get to grips with as might be initially thought. I don't intend to go through dot notation in this video, though. But once you've got accustomed to dot notation and made some comparisons, if need be, with the more modern bracket notation, then you may possibly see the advantage of dot notation and why dot notation is sometimes preferable. I generally won't be reformulating things in modern bracket notation, though, unless I've got a very good reason for doing so. Dot notation is explained comprehensively on pages 9 and 10 of the introduction, though in my opinion, this explanation will only really make sense, ironically, once dot notation is already reasonably well understood. Most of what you need to know about dot notation can be picked up from the first few sections, which naturally start with simpler expressions. Whitehead and Russell recognise that we have to start somewhere. There have to be some undefined, self-evident notions and propositions from which the rest of the theory grows. We see on page 95, since all definitions are affected by means of other terms, every system of definitions which is not circular must start from a certain apparatus of undefined terms. These primitive or undefined terms can be explained using, say, natural language, but they are not defined within the system. Therefore, any explanations of primitive notions and ideas are purely informal in nature. For example, we see again on page 95, the primitive ideas are explained by means of descriptions intended to point out to the reader what is meant, but the explanations do not constitute definitions, because they really involve the ideas that they explain. Whitehead and Russell also say on page 95, it is to some extent optional what ideas we take as undefined in mathematics. The motives guiding our choice will be, one, to make the number of undefined ideas as small as possible, and two, as between two systems in which the number is equal, to choose the one which seems the simpler and easier. So let's start with the primitive ideas that Whitehead and Russell decided upon. I'll simply give the primitive ideas first with a brief explanation, and then afterwards I'll provide some additional comments. The first primitive idea is elementary propositions. Elementary propositions are just a particular kind of proposition. In the definition, informal definition of course, of elementary propositions, we're told that by an elementary proposition, 
we mean one which does not involve any variables, or in other language, one which does not involve such words as all, some, the, or equivalents of such words. The reference to variables is talking about apparent variables. Apparent variables will be explained in more detail in section 9, when they become more immediately relevant. There's no need to exclude propositions which contain real variables, because anything which contains a real variable cannot be a proposition in the first place. Some examples of elementary propositions are things like Mars is a planet, whales are big, snow is red, and so on. The propositions, however, do not have to be true, and typically the letters or symbols P, Q, R, and S will be used in sections 1 to 5 to represent elementary propositions. Elementary propositional functions. Whitehead and Russell say on page 96, by an elementary propositional function, we shall mean an expression containing an undetermined constituent, i.e. a variable, or several such constituents, and such that, when the undetermined constituent or constituents are determined, i.e., when values are assigned to the variable or variables, the resulting value of the expression in question is an elementary proposition. Thus, if P is an undetermined elementary proposition, not P is an elementary propositional function. Elementary propositional functions are a particular kind of propositional function where the values of the function are elementary propositions. Therefore, a propositional function need not necessarily be an elementary propositional function. On page 41 we see that, by a propositional function, we mean something which contains a variable x, and expresses a proposition as soon as a value is assigned to x. That is, it differs from a proposition solely by the fact that it is ambiguous. It contains a variable of which the value is unassigned. The variable referred to here is a real variable, and some examples of elementary propositional functions are x is a planet, y is big, z is red. More information on propositional functions can be found on page 15 of the introduction. Assertion Assertion can possibly be thought of as our notion of truth. A proposition which can be asserted is true. A proposition is indicated as being asserted by use of the assertion symbol. The word truth, wherever it appears, is used in a purely informal way. And note that there's a redundancy in saying something like, P is true since this is the same as simply asserting P. The Polish logician Stanisław Leszniewski was critical of the use of the assertion symbol in Principia Mathematica. For those interested, see Leszniewski's work titled A Podstawach Mathematiki. I have some videos analysing some of this work by Leszniewski on my channel. We will, however, ignore these criticisms in this analysis of Principia Mathematica. Assertion of a propositional function. Other phrases expressing this notion are assertion of an ambiguous value of a propositional function, or simply ambiguous assertion, the latter being used on page 18 of the introduction. Nevertheless, this notion is, at least in the first edition of Principia Mathematica, distinguished from assertion of a proposition, given previously. The symbol, assertion symbol dot phi x, can be read as, any value phi x is true, irrespective of how x is chosen. And this is not the same as, phi x is true for all values of x. As we see on page 18, these two are equivalent notions but not identical, and there is a need to keep them distinguished. Assertion of a propositional function, though related to assertion of a proposition, is fundamentally different. I'll provide some explanation shortly for how such ambiguous assertions might be interpreted. Page 19 of the introduction gives some further details of assertion of a propositional function. There are just some comments that I'd like to make in order to clarify some points relating to these primitive ideas. Whitehead and Russell often refer to expressions such as phi x, psi x, etc. as propositional functions. See page 96.4. This will appear to conflict with the comments on page 42 where we see, thus we should say, phi x is a proposition, but phi blank is a propositional function. We also see on page 15, phi x is an ambiguous value of the propositional function phi blank, and when a definite signification a is substituted for x, phi a is an unambiguous value of phi blank. But on the same page we see phi x is called a propositional function. There are many other instances where expressions such as phi x are referred to as propositional functions. It seems then that sometimes we'll have to rely on the context to tell us whether we're to understand a symbol such as phi x 
as a propositional function or as an ambiguous value of the propositional function phi blank, since the notation is not used entirely consistently. I believe that there are good reasons for this inconsistency though. For example, that phi x is often used when what is meant is phi blank can possibly be compared to the common practice in mathematics of referring to f of x as a function, when I suppose f of x is an ambiguous value of the function f. However, just referring to the function as f does not make it clear whether f is a function of one or more than one variable, and nor does it make it clear what the action of f is on its variables. In certain contexts, this may not be important, but often it is important to know. Suppose we consider phi x as an ambiguous value of the propositional function phi blank. Then how do we interpret this? Phi x, as far as I can see, is not to be thought of as a proposition containing a variable. Such a thing would not be a proposition at all. On page 57 of the introduction we see, whatever contains a real variable is a function, not a proposition. Rather we should think of phi x as a variable proposition. If the values of the propositional function are phi a, phi b, phi c, etc., then, according to the comments on page 41 of the introduction, when we say that phi x ambiguously denotes phi a, phi b, phi c, etc., we mean that phi x means one of the objects phi a, phi b, phi c, etc., though not a definite one, but an undetermined one. Phi x is not itself an actual proposition, but a variable proposition. However, it has all the formal properties of a proposition. Thus we see on page 134, in what follows the single letters P and Q will represent elementary propositions, and so will phi x, psi x, etc. P, Q, phi x and psi x are not actual fixed propositions, but variable propositions. They have the same formal properties as propositions though. Similarly, when it comes to assertion of a propositional function, we should not understand the assertion of phi x as asserting a proposition with a variable. Again, there's no such thing. Rather, the assertion of phi x represents a variable assertion. And using similar wording to that found on page 41 for phi x, we may understand that the assertion of phi x ambiguously denotes the assertion of phi a, the assertion of phi b, the assertion of phi c, etc. We mean that the assertion of phi x means one of the objects the assertion of phi a, the assertion of phi b, the assertion of phi c, etc., though not a definite one, but an undetermined one. We're also told on page 91 that it will be supposed that our variable propositions are all what we shall call elementary propositions, i.e. such as contain no reference, explicit or implicit, to any totality. This means that the symbols that we see in sections 1 to 5 representing propositions, p, q, r, etc., though they don't contain variables, real or apparent, are still themselves variable propositions. Indeed, we see on page 97, no constant elementary proposition will occur in the present work, or can occur in any work which employs only logical ideas. Negation and disjunction. There's not really anything for me to say about negation and disjunction. The explanations are given on the screen. Anyone with any familiarity with symbolic logic and propositional logic will already be familiar with these concepts. However, the choice of negation and disjunction as primitive notions is, evidently, due to fewer primitive propositions being required in comparison with the number of primitive propositions required for choosing other logical constants as primitive. This point is mentioned on page 130, immediately following Proposition 525. We see that in the section on primitive ideas that there are some ideas that are not included and which it might be thought should be included. For example, we don't have explanations for either proposition or variable. Note that both of these terms do appear amongst the explanations of the primitive ideas. Variable is explained in the introduction on page 4, however, there's no explanation given anywhere so far as I can see of proposition. There are, however, some interesting comments regarding propositions on page 46 of the introduction where we see, owing to the plurality of the objects of a single judgment, it follows that what we call a proposition in the sense in which this is distinguished from the phrase expressing it, is not a single entity at all. That is to say, the phrase which expresses a proposition is what we shall call an incomplete symbol. It doesn't have meaning in itself, but requires some supplementation in order to acquire a complete meaning. We also see on the same page, the fact that propositions are incomplete symbols is important philosophically, 
and is relevant at certain points in symbolic logic. The term proposition is dealt with in Russell's Principles of Mathematics, where we see in section 13, a proposition, we may say, is anything that is true or that is false. And in section 16, it may be observed that although implication is indefinable, proposition can be defined. Every proposition implies itself, and whatever is not a proposition implies nothing. Hence to say P is a proposition is equivalent to saying P implies P. And this equivalence may be used to define propositions. This definition of proposition doesn't appear to be relevant, however, to Principia Mathematica, but it's interesting all the same. Definition of implication. On page 94 we see the following. Now in order that one proposition can be inferred from another, it's necessary that the two should have that relation which makes the one a consequence of the other. When a proposition Q is a consequence of a proposition P, we say that P implies Q. Additional details concerning the implicative function can be found on page 7 of the introduction. There will be two main types of implication which we will encounter in Principia Mathematica. The type of implication introduced in definition 1.01 and used throughout 1 to 5 is called material implication. A second type of implication called formal implication will also be used from section 9 onwards and I'll cover this latter type of implication in more detail in the next video. Implication is introduced as a derivative notion defined in terms of negation and disjunction as in definition 1.01. This is also the first definition that we encounter in Principia Mathematica. As Whitehead and Russell have pointed out though in the introduction on page 11 and 12, definitions are strictly speaking theoretically superfluous. This doesn't mean that definitions are practically superfluous though. Definitions are not propositions, though as we shall see, it may be possible to make them into propositions, and since they're not propositions, they're neither true nor false. They're not a part of the formal system, but simply a convenience. Note that when a definition is given, the notation used is an equal sign with df written at the end, which is to be thought of as a single informal symbol. An equal sign alone means something different which will be later defined. Therefore, the use of the equal sign in definitions is not presupposing equality as a concept within the system. Implication is to be understood as a relation between propositions. It's not a relation between propositional functions. Therefore, when we see expressions such as phi x implies psi x, we're not to understand this as an implication between propositions containing variables, since propositions do not contain variables, of course, but as a variable implication. The implication function, material implication, as defined by Whitehead and Russell, works in the same way that implication works in modern propositional logic. So again, anyone with some familiarity with symbolic logic probably already has some understanding of how it works. Note that implication does not suggest any cause and effect relationship between the antecedent and consequent. For example, grass is green implies cows are mammals is a valid implication, but there is no causal effect between grass is green and cows are mammals. Of course, grass is green, and cows eat grass, but the greenness of the grass doesn't cause the cows to be mammals. We're not concerned with any necessary connection in symbolic logic. Any true proposition will, as we shall see, imply any other true proposition irrespective of any causal connection or lack thereof. We now look at the primitive propositions, some of which are not expressed in a purely symbolic form. Inference. We have two rules of inference, the first, 1.1, applies to elementary propositions, and the second, 1.11, applies to ambiguous assertion. A question that may naturally be asked at this stage is, why do we need rules of inference? Isn't implication sufficient? I'll just spend some time explaining the notion of logical inference, and how it's to be distinguished from implication. Suppose I have an implication, P implies Q, which happens to be true. Then it may be felt that Q should be true. Unfortunately, I can't make this deduction. The implication may be true, but this doesn't require P or Q to be individually true. That we expect Q to be true when the implication P implies Q is true may be something to do with us possibly expecting a causal relationship, or that we might be implicitly assuming that P is true when it needn't be. Of course, it may be the case that Q is true. It's just that the implication alone is not sufficient for me to deduce that. For example, the following two implications are true. Fish are mammals implies grass is pink. 
fish are mammals implies grass is green. In the first case, we see that both antecedents and consequents are false. But in the second case, the antecedent is false, while the consequence is true. Therefore, a correct implication alone is insufficient to make any inference about whether Q is true. The rules of inference give the necessary conditions for me to conclude that Q is true. Namely, when I know that both P is true, and P implies Q is true. However, I still need a formal rule that provides the specific instruction that allows the transition from the assertion of P and the assertion of P implies Q to the assertion of Q, and the required rule is 1.1, or in the case of ambiguous assertion, 1.11. These rules of inference cannot be reduced to a purely symbolic form, although it may seem as though this is possible. For example, we might try proposition 3.35. But unfortunately this is not sufficient since 3.35 holds in all cases and not only in the case when both P and P implies Q are true and even in the case of P and P implies Q both being true without 1.1 or 1.11 I'm not able to assert Q. 3.35 contains no instruction to drop the true premise. Moreover 3.35 deals with the assertion of the logical product of P and P implies Q and not the separate assertions of P and P implies Q. As stated by Russell, an inference is the dropping of a true premise. It is the dissolution of an implication. Additionally, 1.11 does not require the functions phi blank and psi blank to be elementary propositional functions. There are also some more slightly subtle points relating to 1.11, which is well to understand. Some of the points may seem obvious at first, but do, at least in my opinion, requires some clarification. Notice that in the statement of 1.11, the implication we see is phi x implies psi x, rather than something like phi x implies psi y. In the latter case, it would be understood that the variables x and y represent different variables, ranging over possibly the same type but possibly different types. Such an implication is not invalid though. However, by having phi x implies psi x, we understand x as representing, in this context, the same variable. We will, however, have to be careful on this point from section 9 onwards, where the same letter in a proposition may not represent the same variable, especially when we're dealing with apparent variables. On page 94, implication is described as a relation between propositions. We're to understand an expression such as phi x implies psi x as expressing a relation between the values of the propositional functions phi blank and psi blank, which holds in the case where the value of the argument of the propositional function phi blank is the same as the value of the argument in the propositional function psi blank. And thus it would seem that the propositional functions phi blank and psi blank range over the same type since implication is a relation between propositions and clearly, if there are not propositions to relate, then there is no relation. If phi a is significant for some value of the argument a, but psi a is not significant, then psi a is not a proposition, this is a meaningless symbol, and so no relation of implication could exist between phi a and psi a. There is a further point though, which may seem very pedantic, but I believe needs addressing, which is, does the proposition phi a, where a is some value for which the propositional function phi blank is significant, undergo any change when it's considered as existing in a relation, and in this particular case, in a relation with the proposition psi a and the relation being implication? The answer to this appears to be of course no, but how can we justify this? Well it seems that the phi a on its own and the phi a which appears in the implication must have numerical identity. In other words, they must be exactly the same proposition. If phi a underwent some kind of change when considered as the antecedent in this relation, then the relation would not in fact be a relation involving the proposition phi a as considered in isolation, but rather some other proposition, and it would seem that we would never actually be able to say anything about the isolated proposition phi a. Therefore, if phi a is a significant proposition when considered in isolation, then phi a is a significant proposition when considered in the relation of implication as above. Therefore, we can guarantee that if phi a is significant, then phi a implies psi a must be significant. Therefore, by using a similar argument, psi a must also be significant. Thus, the propositional function psi blank ranges over exactly the same type as phi blank.
The upshot then is that by making inferences using 1.11, we can guarantee that we will always remain working within the same type. There's no risk that we will inadvertently wander into a different type, and this is going to be important to us in sections 1 to 5. Note that 1.11 is also called by Whitehead and Russell the axiom of identification of type on page 100. This transition to different types may be possible further down the line, but we require a stronger rule of inference to deal with such cases. I just have a few general comments to make regarding the remaining primitive propositions which are given in section 1 and which are shown on the screen now. The choice of primitive propositions may appear unusual in some cases. Some explanation is given by Whitehead and Russell on page 13 of the introduction. We also see following the statements of 1.5 the comment that the more natural form of the associative law has less deductive power and is therefore not taken as a primitive proposition. Those more familiar with the second edition of Principia Mathematica may be aware that serious changes were made concerning the primitive ideas and primitive propositions, the details of which I won't however get into in this video. It's not clear to me why brackets are used in the statements of 1.5, since it would be possible to express 1.5 using only dot notation as shown. For example, the demonstration of 241 asserts an instance of 1.5, but does not use brackets and uses dot notation instead. There are some additional primitive propositions that will be introduced in later sections, but the ones given in section 1 suffice for the development of the propositional calculus in sections 2 to 5. Following the statement of 1.72, the axiom of identification of real variables, Whitehead and Russell says that if phi and psi are functions which take arguments of different types, there is no such function as the disjunction of phi x and psi x. This does not mean, however, that we cannot form the function the disjunction of phi x and psi y, where x and y are different variables which range over different types, though we will need either some new axiom or at least a suitably strengthened axiom to be able to do this. The propositions of section 2 are some simple propositions that, in some cases, follow immediately from the primitive propositions. As Whitehead and Russell state, many of the initial propositions are nothing more than instances of the primitive propositions with suitable substitutions. Indeed, we see that the inferential rules are not required for any of 2.01 to 2.05. The first application of a rule of inference is in 2.06, and it will be noted that as we go through these next few sections that 1.1 is hardly ever used, whereas 1.11 is constantly used. Arguably 1.1 is more fundamental in nature, but just less useful in practice. Whitehead and Russell are quite thorough initially when it comes to including the details of their demonstrations. Naturally though, this level of detail cannot be maintained, and it will be seen that it quickly becomes necessary to give more outline details. On page 7, that's 7 in Roman numerals, Whitehead and Russell write, The proofs of the earliest propositions are given without the omission of any step. But as the work proceeds, the proofs are gradually compressed, retaining, however, sufficient detail to enable the reader, by the help of the references, to reconstruct proofs in which no step is omitted. It's worth spending some time with these earlier proofs in order to gain some familiarity with the notation and the typical kinds of ideas that are used. I also find it quite useful, though initially quite difficult, to reconstruct some of the omitted proofs. Once you've got your head around dot notation, which doesn't take too long, then Principia Mathematica is much easier to read and understand. There will still be some other difficulties, but at least dot notation won't be something that you need to worry about. And having a fairly strict mindset regarding notation in the early stages may mean that you can be a bit more relaxed later on about notation without worrying too much. Another reason to be fairly strict initially is to be able to see a bit more clearly the kinds of things that you might be taking for granted. Sometimes it happens that we're taking steps in our reasoning that are ultimately correct, but haven't really been acknowledged. Whitehead and Russell are trying, in Principia Mathematica, to expose as many of the assumptions as possible and provide suitable justifications for the use of certain techniques. The propositions that we see in numbers 2 to 5 are included for several different reasons. In some cases, the propositions are of some significance in and of themselves. For example, 2.11 is the law of excluded middle, 2.12 and 2.14 are together the principle of double negation, and so on. There are also other propositions that seem quite random and whose significance is initially difficult to determine. Many of these propositions are included because they will be required further down the line, 
others are included for completeness. It's not necessary to remember all of the propositions as you read through Principia Mathematica, nor is it necessary to remember the demonstrations. You may, however, need to be prepared to flip backwards and forwards to find the right propositions as they come up in the demonstrations from time to time. Principia Mathematica is not necessarily something that you will read only in the forwards direction. Anyone who already has some familiarity with symbolic logic will probably not find anything particularly difficult in these first few sections. The propositions proved are exactly the kinds of things that will be seen on any elementary course on symbolic logic. My goal here is not to go through each and every proposition and its proof, though I will be going through some of the demonstrations. What I'm wanting to do in these first few sections is point out some of the notational quirks that we see, because there's not really much else for me to comment on. There'll be much more for me to comment on in the later sections. I'll therefore be making a few comments on the propositions and demonstrations where I feel that it's appropriate to do so, and if I feel that a more complete analysis is required, then I'll give one, but if not, then not. So some important propositions in section 2. Well, there's not much for me to say about the propositions 2.01 to 2.05, though 2.01 shows that a proposition which implies its own negation is false, and 2.02 shows that any true proposition is always implied by any proposition, and so on. On page 102, Whitehead and Russell write, The proofs of the earlier of the propositions of this number consist simply in noticing that they are instances of the general rules given in section 1. In such cases, these rules are not premises, since they assert any instance of themselves, not something other than their instances. This comment is, I think, referring to the propositions 2.01 to 2.05, as well as a few other propositions, where no actual logical inference is made in the demonstrations. The demonstration consists in asserting an instance of a rule, and then using a definition to slightly alter the form of the proposition, but ultimately, it's still the same underlying proposition. When inferences are involved, then we have something like we see in 2.06, where proposition 2.04 asserts an instance of itself in line 1, and then this is used as a premise, along with 2.05, to make an inference, and thus COM, or the commutative principle, as Proposition 2.04 is called, is used as a means to assert something other than an instance of itself. 2.08 shows that a proposition always implies itself. As I've already mentioned, Russell uses this as a definition of proposition in Principles of Mathematics. 2.11 is the well-known law of excluded middle. From this proposition we see, then, that in the system of Principia Mathematica, at least, every significant proposition is either true or false. Of course, there are, or were, certain systems which do not, or did not, accept this principle as being generally valid. Other notable propositions are 2.16 and 2.17, as will become clear once equivalence is introduced, together are effectively the principle of transposition, which forms the basis of proof by contrapositive. 2.31 and 2.32 show that logical addition is associative, following which we are given definition 2.33, which allows us to ignore the brackets when we have a logical addition of three propositions. Things actually get quite repetitive in this section. Many of the propositions that are presented, though not necessarily explicitly proved, are simply different forms of the same proposition, for example, propositions 2.5 to 2.521, many of which are used later in the work, and many of which are included more for the sake of completeness. The square brackets used in demonstrations and the information included in the square brackets are an informal and theoretically unnecessary addition to demonstrations. They are there merely to help the reader understand which propositions the authors have used in making certain assertions, inferences and deductions, or to indicate some of the propositions that the authors recommend that the reader consider when trying to construct demonstrations themselves for those propositions where the authors have omitted the demonstrations. The information contained in the square brackets will not always be complete. Eventually, only the difficult-to-identify propositions will be mentioned, with the other propositions required in the demonstration being left to the reader to figure out for himself. On that note, then, there are no strict rules to the usage of square brackets or the information that they contain, so far as I've been able to determine. Square brackets are used in a variety of ways in different sets of circumstances, and what the information contained in the square brackets specifically indicates will often need to be figured out on a case-by-case -case basis. 
I will, however, look at some of the demonstrations that are in Principia Mathematica and give some of my thoughts on them, though, of course, I won't be going through all of the demonstrations. Let's take a look at the demonstration of 2.01, and specifically line 1. The information in the square brackets indicates that the primitive proposition called taught is being used in some way. Taught is primitive proposition 1.2. What specifically does the information in the brackets mean? It means that 1.2 has been used with the substitution not p in the place of the p which appears in the general statement of 1.2 on page 100. How does this assertion come about? Well, the general statement of 1.2 applies to any elementary proposition p. However, 1.2 does not specify the exact form of p. We know that using the primitive propositions 1.7 and 1.71 that we can form new elementary propositions using negation and disjunction, and therefore implication and, as we will see, logical product and equivalence. Therefore, if p is an elementary proposition, then we also know that not p is an elementary proposition, and since 1.2 applies to any elementary proposition, then it must also apply to the elementary proposition not p. Of course, we could build up even more complicated elementary propositions using 1.7 and 1.71, but no matter how complicated the propositions are, 1.2 will still apply to them, since they are, after all, elementary propositions. Therefore, the proposition, the disjunction of not p and not p implies not p, is of the same form as the proposition expressing the general statement of 1.2. Therefore, the disjunction of not p and not p implies not p is just an instance of 1.2. Any instance of a true proposition can be asserted. And so, since 1.2 is a true proposition, and the disjunction of not p and not p implies not p is an instance of it, then we get the assertion 1 in the demonstration of 2.01. The next line in the demonstration of 2.01 is as highlighted. We see on page 102 what the information in the square brackets means. It means that, in virtue of 1.01, the new set of symbols asserts the same proposition as was asserted in 1. The round brackets around the 1.01 indicate that 1.01 is a definition, and hence theoretically superfluous. The demonstrations of propositions 2.02 .02 to 2.05 follow an identical format as 2.01, just with different propositions used for the first lines. Let's now look at the demonstration of 2.06, where we see the first line as shown. This assertion comes about in an analogous way to the assertion on the first line of the demonstration of 2.01, so I won't say any more about it. The next line, though, is as shown, and the information in the square brackets indicates that 2.05 has been used in some way to obtain this assertion, and we can easily see that this assertion is, in fact, the exact statement of 2.05 without any substitutions whatsoever. The last line reads as shown, and this is the first time that we see one of the rules of inference, 1.11, used, that were introduced to in section 1. The use of 1.11 can be detailed as follows. If we consider phi pqr and psi pqr to be the propositional functions as shown, then we see that line 1 of the demonstration is the assertion of phi pqr, and line 2 is the assertion of phi pqr implies psi pqr. Then these two assertions are of the exact form required for an application of 1.11. Note that 1.11 is not limited to propositional functions of one variable, as stated on page 99. Hence the assertion of psi pqr follows, which is the last line of the demonstration of 2.06. Therefore, the information on the last line, in the square brackets, is simply indicating that the assertions on lines 1 and 2 have been used along with 1.11 to obtain the assertion which follows. The notation used in the demonstration of 2.08 can easily be understood on the basis of what we've seen so far. And already in the demonstration of 2.11, we're starting to see omissions now that we have some basic familiarity with how the demonstrations are going to work. An extra line could have been included between the two existing lines of the demonstration, which would have made the demonstration look more like as shown on the screen now. As we see though, the square brackets on the final line of the demonstration of 2.11 indicate that the assertion 1 and the statement of 2.1 are used to form the basis of the inference made using 1.11 without actually going to the trouble of asserting anew the proposition 2.1. Note that proposition 2.1 is used exactly as in the statement of 
without any substitutions. And also note that even when substitutions are used, they will not always be explicitly mentioned in square brackets, and this will certainly be the case in the sections which follow. We'll jump ahead now to the comments following the demonstration of 2.15. Note that already in 2.15 we're getting quite lengthy demonstrations for what we might consider a very simple proposition. If we keep this up, the demonstrations of the much more complicated propositions which are to come are going to go on forever. Using the note following the demonstration of 2.15, Whitehead and Russell thankfully decide to introduce a notational convenience to help shorten the lengths of the demonstrations. It's well worth being aware of these notational shortcuts, because they can save a lot of time and space. However, it's also worth being aware of what the unshortened original arguments are as well. Using this notational shortcut we see that lines 7 to 11 of the demonstration of 215 can simply be replaced with the line as shown. There is also a comment following the demonstration of 215 regarding a shorthand notation which indicates the use of the inference rule 1.1 or more likely 1.11 without necessarily writing out in full all of the details. We have the assertion of P1 implies the assertion of P2 which acts as a shorthand for the assertion of P1, the assertion of P1 implies P2, the assertion of P2. Page 9 of the introduction gives more details regarding this notation. Note that this shorthand notation can be written in multiple different formats, all of which mean the same thing as shown on the screen. And we can also extend to longer chains of inferences as shown. This longer chain of inference can be seen, for example, in the demonstration of 326, line 2. All of these notations will be seen at various times and their interpretation needs to be understood which is one of the reasons why again it's worth getting familiar with some of these things so that they don't catch you off guard further down the line. We see this shorthand notation for inferences used in the demonstration of 216. The line labelled 1 of the demonstration of 216 is as highlighted. Which is, of course, of the form the assertion of P1 implies the assertion of P2. In the demonstration of 2.16 we see another shortcut being introduced. For example, the 2.12 in square brackets would possibly have previously also indicated which substitutions have been made, and we might have seen something more like 2.12 q over p in square brackets. And similarly we see only 2.05 in square brackets, instead of the more detailed 2.05 not not q over r. The more detailed information concerning the specific substitutions made will continue to be used but will become much less common. You'll usually have to figure this information out for yourself later. We also see on the final line of the demonstration of 216 the other new bit of notation used which was introduced after the demonstration of 215. Let's now have a look at the demonstration of 2.2 where on the first line we see as shown. Which if we use the comments following the demonstrations of 215 would evidently be a shortened version of the argument as shown. In this sequence of assertions we see that the first line is simply the assertion of 1.3, exactly as written in section 1. The second line is an implication, the antecedent is the same proposition as in line 1, and the consequence is, however, proposition 1.3, with P and Q interchanged. This line arguably would need further steps to justify. And then finally, we have the application of 1.11. From what I can see, this notation is introduced to avoid using square brackets to indicate relevant propositions, etc., since arguably the line 1 in the demonstration of 2.2 could be written as shown. It may be thought that this new notation is brought in to indicate that the assertion of P implies Q or P is obtained by an application of add, but without going to the trouble of referencing the appropriate substitutions. This doesn't seem to be justified, because... The substitutions are not forced to be indicated in the square brackets anyway, as we saw in the demonstration of 216. But also, in the demonstration of 345 we see as shown, which clearly indicates which proposition is used to obtain the assertion and which substitution needs to be made. Not only that, we see in the demonstration of 432 as shown, which clearly shows which proposition is used, 415, to derive the assertion which follows. However, the assertion which follows is the exact statement of 415 as it appears in Principia Mathematica and with no substitutions. Therefore, I can only conclude that this new notation is introduced to avoid the need to use square brackets, which, as we will see, the use of square brackets will not cease entirely 
but will become less frequent. The prop notation introduced following the demonstration of 2.16 is particularly useful in situations such as the demonstration of 2.31, where the statement of the proposition to be proved is spread across several lines of the demonstration, or, in other cases, if the penultimate step of the demonstration is only a definition away from the exact form of the proposition to be proved. However, prop is something that will be used to end, as far as I can see, the demonstration of just about every proposition that's given in Principia Mathematica. So let's look further then at the demonstration of Proposition 231, because there's quite a bit to be said here. It's not clear to me why brackets are used in 231. For example, an instance of 231 is asserted in the demonstration of 2.4, but using dot notation rather than brackets. And this doesn't affect anything, but I thought it worth pointing out. Between the statement of 231 and its demonstration, we see another new notational shortcut being introduced. What we see here is a new rule of inference being brought in. If we have the assertions, the assertion of A implies B and the assertion of B implies C, then we see in the notes on page 109 following the statements of 231 that through repeated use of SIL, or the principle of the syllogism, which is referring to either 2.05 or 2.06, and 1.11, which is the basic rule of inference, we can systematically obtain the assertion of A implies C. This can also be extended to longer chains of implications. The point is that this is a routine and systematic process. The form of this logical deduction we accept as a new rule of inference. In fact, this is not completely new. The comments following Proposition 215 are suggesting that SIL be a new rule of inference, though here we're showing how it works a bit more generally. We also get some new abbreviated notation to help shorten demonstrations, and which clearly indicates when the new type of inference is being used. Notice the difference in the notation used. When an inference using 1.11 is abbreviated, there is an assertion sign immediately following the implication symbol. If on the other hand we use SIL as a rule of inference, then there's no assertion sign after each implication symbol. So now we have several different abbreviated notations, all of which will be used throughout, but some will be used more than others. The etc. in square brackets is used to reference, if need be, any relevant propositions which have been used in the demonstration. And depending on the context, we may also have, as shown on the screen now, where 1 indicates the line, the assertion of A implies D. As a comparison of the different notations, here's the demonstration of 215 rewritten using each of the new notations introduced. The notation introduced after the demonstration of 215, and the notation introduced just after the demonstration of 231. Of course, there may be other ways of writing out the demonstration besides these two. Remember that there are not strict rules governing the use of square brackets, the information contained therein, and how the referenced propositions are used exactly. There are, of course, other propositions which can be used effectively as rules of inference. Ultimately, everything boils down to repeated application of 1.11, though. It's just that relying only on 1.11 as the sole rule of inference results in very lengthy and tedious demonstrations, as we've seen. It would seem that any main proposition that expresses an implication between two subordinate propositions can often be converted to a rule of inference. Suppose, for example, we take 2.02. Then we can have the argument as shown. Here we see on the second line an instance of 2.02 being asserted. We might also see this argument written as shown on the screen now, where 2.02 is referenced and used as a premise but without actually going to the trouble of asserting it, just like in the demonstration of 2.11 as mentioned earlier. However, if we use 2.02 as a rule of inference, we simply get the argument as shown on the screen now. Recall that, as stated on page 9 of the introduction, an inference is the dropping of a true premise. It is the dissolution of an implication. In this last case, rather than an instance of 2.02 being asserted, it's used as a rule of inference. That 2.02 has been used in some way is indicated in the same way in each case, by writing 2.02 in square brackets on the relevant line. But the use of 2.02 is different in this third case as compared to the other two cases. Note that 2.02 does not appear among the premises in this last case, but it does in the first and second cases. Moreover, in the first case, since 2.02 appeared among the premises, we had to resort to using a different rule of inference, 
to make the inference that we wanted to make. It may be argued that this third case is nothing more than a concealed application of 1.11, and that's exactly right. Every rule of deduction which is applied as a rule of inference is a derivative rule of inference which can always ultimately be expressed in terms of applications of 111. The new rules of inference are abbreviations for lengthy but formally very similar or identical sequences of steps. Also note that 111 does not appear among the premises in the first two cases. Just because it's referenced in the square brackets does not mean that it's a premise. Hence a rule of inference does not appear among the premises. All we have to note in each case is that, given certain assertions, there is a systematic way of obtaining a certain other assertion. The new rule of inference is effectively an abbreviation for this form of deduction, and if there is a particular proposition that's being repeatedly used, then it may be appropriate to name that rule of inference after that particular proposition. For example, we see in the notes following 2.15 and the statement of 2.31 that SIL is being repeatedly used alongside 1.11. It makes sense for us to refer to an inference of this form, therefore, as SIL. It's somewhat useful to be able to distinguish between a proposition being used as a rule of inference and a proposition being used as a premise. Though this distinction will not always be reflected in the way that the proposition is referenced in demonstrations in Principia Mathematica. As already mentioned, when a proposition is being used as a rule of inference, then it's not included among the premises. Take the example that's shown on the screen now. Here, SIL is indicated as being used, but it's being used as a rule of inference. If I were to include SIL as a premise, then I would obtain something like the argument as shown on the screen now. But then, if I want to use 3 as a premise, I'll usually need to use a different rule of inference. A rule of inference included amongst the premises means that a further rule of inference is required, which doesn't appear among the premises, to actually make the inference. Note that Whitehead and Russell say in the note at the bottom of page 102 that later on we shall cease to mark the distinction between a premise and a rule according to which an inference is conducted. It is only in early proofs that this distinction is important. Therefore, whether something is being used as a premise or as a rule of inference will often have to be determined by the context in which it appears. Thus we see on page 111 that when a general principle of deduction is used as a rule of inference, a reference will be included amongst the references to the premises to which the rule is being applied as a rule of inference. The notation regarding which propositions are being used to make various deductions and inferences beyond a certain point does not follow a simple pattern of use as far as I can see. Exactly what is meant is best figured out on a case-by-case -case basis whenever the need arises rather than trying to figure out strict rules of usage. Once we get past section 2 there isn't much to say other than a few remarks here and there. Section 3 introduces the logical product. The definition of the logical product is exactly the definition of logical product that might be seen in a modern context. As stated, Proposition 3.03 .03 is a more convenient form of the axiom of identification of real variables, 1.72. I suppose the reason that 1.72 was given as the primitive proposition rather than 3.03 .03 is because 3.03 .03 is not possible without a definition of logical product, which is defined in terms of the primitive idea of disjunction. Therefore, the axiom of identification of real variables is better initially stated in the form of 1.72. There's an error that I've identified in the demonstration of Proposition 3.03. .03. In the line labelled 3, the 3.03 .03 in the square brackets should be 3.01. Of course, the demonstration of a proposition cannot use the proposition to be proved in its own demonstration. The corrected version of the demonstration can be seen on the screen now. The primitive proposition 1.72 and the proposition 3.03 .03 are used so often that they will usually not be explicitly referenced. It's very easy to take the application of these propositions for granted, and we may often hardly even realise that they are being used. In section 3 we get some more natural forms for the principle of the syllogism. See propositions 3.33 and 3.34. Henceforth, when syllogism is referred to, then it will usually be these propositions. Some of the numbering of the propositions in this section is slightly strange. For example, we have 322 and 324, but no 323. We also have 326, but no 325. I can only guess that the reason for this is that there originally were propositions 323 and 325, 
but they were possibly removed because they were deemed unnecessary. And to change the proposition numbers from 324 and 326 to, say, 323 and 324, respectively, would have required any references to these propositions to be changed also, which would have been very laborious and very likely that some would be overlooked and would create much confusion. Of course, I can't say for certain what the reason is. Moving on to section 4, we're introduced to the idea of logical equivalence. 4.2, 21 and 22 show that equivalence of propositions is what would often be called an equivalence relation. Two propositions are equivalent does not mean that they are equal. We do not have a notion of equality between propositions, other than I suppose the trivial kind of equality which would mean that P and Q are equal, if and only if they are in fact exactly the same proposition. This concept of equality of propositions, if indeed it is a thing, does not appear in Principia Mathematica. To say that two propositions are equivalent means nothing more than they have the same truth value. Equivalence is only concerned with the truth values, and not at all with the specific content of the propositions. Either they are both true, or they are both false. The propositions in question need not have anything to do with each other. For example, the propositions lions are mammals, and the earth orbits the sun, are equivalent propositions by virtue of the fact that both propositions happen to be true. Equivalence allows certain substitutions to be made. For example, on page 8 of the introduction, which also includes more details about truth values and truth functions, we see, thus whenever two propositions are known to be equivalent, either may be substituted for the other in any formula with which we shall have occasion to deal. This is a result of the fact that we're only interested in truth functions, that is, propositional functions which depend only on the truth values of the propositions involved, and not on the specific contents of the propositions or any other factors. In the demonstration of 432, we see a notational convenience used which is based on the result of 422, and which resembles that introduced before the demonstration of 231 on page 109, except in this case we have equivalence symbols instead of implications. Note that it's often convenient to express definitions as equivalences, at least when the thing being defined is actually a proposition. If what's being defined is some other kind of logical object, then it may not be possible to express a definition as an equivalence, since equivalence is only applicable to propositions. Examples of converting a definition into an equivalence are 4.5 and 4.6, which convert definitions 3.01 and 1.01 respectively into equivalences. Use of proposition 4.2 and the definition which is to be converted to an equivalence gives a fairly systematic way of doing this. In section 5 we see a range of different propositions, some of which may seem unusual at first glance. The reason for the inclusion of most of these propositions seems to be more that they are required in the demonstrations of later propositions, but don't seem to fit nicely into any of the previous numbers. Whitehead and Russell say that 511, 12, 13 and 14 have been included for their intrinsic interest. Interpretations of these propositions might go as follows. 511 Either a proposition or its negation implies any other proposition. 5.12. A proposition implies either a proposition or its negation. 5.13. Of two propositions, one must imply the other. And 5.14. Either a proposition is implied by a proposition or it implies a proposition. We also see a comment on page 130 following 525. This comment points out that implication could be taken as a primitive idea instead of disjunction, but that this choice would result in more primitive propositions. Interestingly, in Russell's book The Principles of Mathematics, he does take implication to be a primitive notion or primitive idea, and defines negation and disjunction in terms of implication, though arguably in quite a cumbersome way. Following 571, we see the notation HP being introduced as a shorthand way of referring to the hypothesis, that is, the antecedent of the main implication of a proposition, which is to be proved. Thus, HP in the demonstration of 571 means Q implies not R, since this is the antecedent of the main or primary implication of the proposition 571. That brings us to the end of this section, and the end of this video. The next video, which may appear in two parts, will cover section B, where there will be much more material to cover. Please get in touch if there's anything relating to this video that you'd like clarification on,
or if you have any feedback on this video or any other videos that I've made. Thanks for watching.